and welcome to uh, Walking Through Advent with us. The hashtag Holy Hackets. And also some other brilliant people that are going to be contributing as we go through. Um, this is our attempt at a mini-series, really, at trying to be creative, uh, looking at the Christmas story through the lens of 21st century characters. It just feels really important that as Christians we share our faith stories, share our experiences of life with one another. And so that's really uh, what we're going to be doing through Advent. So during this series we're going to be looking at uh, five different characters. We're looking at Mary, at Joseph, at the Shepherds, at King Herod, who mm. is, and <laughs> at the Magi. And thinking about some of the people in our 21st century world that might relate to something of their stories. Uh, as we do this, we don't just want it to be our special guest stories that we hear, but we also want to hear from all of you. Mm. So if you feel able and comfortable to, we'd love you to share some of your stories and experiences in the comments during or after the video. Mm. I don't know about all of you, but 2020 didn't really go the way that we thought it was going to be. We've had to be creative and reimagine and rethink all sorts of things um, for this year and, and Advent feels like one of them but actually we feel a bit like sometimes we rush through Advent so quickly uh, we're so focused on Christmas Day on planning dinner who's coming to dinner of course this year which bubble will we be in and mm. um, you know thinking about presents like Jez is so hard to buy for and, and and already thinking about decorating the Christmas tree we bought our decorations weeks ago which is really bad so really this year this series is a time to focus to breathe to watch and to wait through Advent together. And so as we watch and engage with these stories together, or as we explore some of those questions, let's be challenged, encouraged and transformed by the God who encounters us through the incarnation of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Today we are looking at the story of the shepherds and recognising that although they're not considered a job to aspire to or a job of great status and wealth, Actually, they are essential and important workers in God's eyes. Similarly, today in these strange 2020 times, when we see how essential workers who have kept our country going through a global pandemic have not been those jobs aspired to for wealth and status. Rather, they have been humble, lower paid workers often taken for granted. And so today we will hear the stories of Sue, Vicky and Phil, who all work for the NHS that we are all indebted to and continually praying for in these uncertain times. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. For see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favours. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So um, I am a clinical scientist, um, a clinical physiologist, I work in um, sleep and acute non-invasive ventilation. My PhD was looking at people um, who faint, something called syncope, and their blood pressure control. And then when I finished that, I went into doing a postdoc, looking at blood pressure control in people with a condition called sleep apnea. My typical day is very, very varied, from um, working on a ward with a respiratory ward, looking after patients who um, need ventilation uh, uh, through a mask um, to help them breathe, to um, analysing sleep studies, um, some that are full wired up looking at people's sleep stages, others are just looking at their breathing patterns during sleep, and then other 
parts of my day um, are setting up people with um, something called CPAP, which is a machine people use to breathe at night um, when they've got sleep apnea. So for me, I'm also a clinical scientist, but in a different area. So I, I work in medical physics, predominantly for people who are diagnosed with cancer. Um, one of the range of treatment options is uh, radiotherapy, where we deliver high doses of radiation to kill off the tumour cells. Taking um, CT and MR and other imaging modalities and combining them together, the doctors will identify where in the body um, they need to treat and deliver the radiation to. Uh, and they will write a prescription to say, right, this is the area I want to give a certain amount of dose. And our role is to plan how to arrange the radiation beams to deliver the dose just to that area and minimize the uh, dose to surrounding tissues to try and limit the potential side effects. Um, and then also to calibrate and to um, monitor the performance of the treatment machines, the linear accelerators that we use, and um, to make sure that they are replicating the plans that we've created when it comes to treating the patients. My job, I'm a cardiac nurse. I've worked in cardiac nursing most of my nursing career, having spent a lot of time on primary care units. Now I'm working in cardiac rehabilitation and getting people fit again after heart surgery, heart attacks and that sort of thing. It's great, really. I mean, I think any, any profession uh, where you're dealing with people is always going to be demanding, but rewarding. The rewarding bit is, I think, true all the way through caring professions that you can do simple things that mean a lot to people. Being a, an advocate for patients, so you know, everybody's busy in hospitals. So when you have a doctor on a round and, and they're conscious that they've got 40 people to see that day all with different problems, um, it's my role sometimes to, to stop that person and, and say, was there something else that you wanted to ask the doctor? That can be rewarding as well. It's always going to be demanding. You're always juggling lots of different demands, um, getting things right. Uh, first time obviously um, and it never doesn't matter so when you go to work if you're having a bad day you can't think well I'll, I'll do a half-hearted job because it doesn't matter because it's always going to matter. I would say it's very rewarding the reward for my my uh, job um, in the sleep side of things is when I take a patient that's really disabled by their sleep apnea they, they're falling asleep all the time in the day they're struggling with work, some have even lost their jobs, they've got all sorts of different like depression type symptoms and I stick them on a CPAP machine and see them a few weeks later and I call it the Eeyore to Tigger syndrome because you've, you've taken Eeyore and you've turned him into to Tigger. A bit difficult, different in my role in that it's not as directly patient um, facing so we don't necessarily see the results of some of the work that we do um, but it does hit home. So we'll say describing the two sides of the role is working with the machines and working on the treatment plants. And in some ways, if you made a mistake or made an error on uh, while working on the treatment machines, you could do a lot more damage, but it hits more when there's a name attached with the work that you're doing, that you know that somebody's grandmother or grandfather or wife or husband um, and you know that the time you're spending to get that plan as good as it possibly can be, um, that would be, if, if it was your relative in the same position, you'd want the person working on that plan to do exactly the same thing. So it, it's kind of a, a privilege, but also a pressure, I find. It, it is pressurized. Um, it doesn't stop me enjoying my job, but it does make it does make life harder. Um, we end up doing more hours than you know than we should do. Um, but I don't think I changed my job just because of the pressure. In terms of the the COVID situation in relation to my work, working at the Christie, um, it 
it was kind of a bit of a strange period, certainly in March and, and April, um, because there was a lot of steps put in place. I mean, we've, we've stayed open and stayed available to treat patients all the way through because obviously cancer um, will still be happening uh, even through the, the course of a pandemic. The, the difficulty was making sure that we were able to treat everybody in a safe fashion. Now that things have um, step back up again. Um, we're back to where treating the same number of patients as we were this time last year, which is obviously it's kind of a bit, bit of a weird thing to say. It's good, but it means obviously it's bad because people are still getting cancer. But it means that um, people are going back to the GPs and coming through uh, and getting the treatment they need. So when Josh was born, um, there was various complications as he was born, um, which meant that um, uh, he had to get a paediatrician. He was delivered to an emergency cesarean, um, was in a very bad way, and the paediatricians had to take over and resuscitate him. That was just their job. That's just what they did. They'll do that day in, day out. We owe those people our son, um, and there's nothing, no way we could ever repay them. Like everybody, you go to work, you have your days where it's, it is a job and it's, oh, when am I going home and there's so much more to do. Um, but the first reaction, oh, they're, because, oh, they're wonderful, the Christie can't have it, say it. A bad thing, you know, they, they've done this from, from my relatives and it kind of struck home that there's people out there who look at what we do as a hospital um, and are eternally grateful in a way that we're grateful to the paediatrician. Yeah, that that does drive you on. That does make you um, commit to those long hours and making sure that everything's as best as it possibly can. Because you know it could be your member of the family, a member of your family who's on the receiving end one day. The challenges for me are trying to deliver a service which is all about activity, moving, getting people motivated, getting people fit, and that's really hard to do on the end of the phone, sitting in front of the computer, that you can't encourage people doing activity and congratulate them and motivate them when they're not actually doing it at the time, you can't see them. And, you know, trying to see what the, the future is, trying to think about how you can deliver good care in a different way. I think the things that um, were particularly important were we know how lonely people were and how isolated people were. And so to be able to be that person who would ring up. Um, so people who've come home from hospital will try and ring within the first week to say, how are you doing? And quite often it's that first phone call. You know, it's not uncommon to have people in full tears on, on the end of the phone because they, they don't know what to do. They don't know what they can do when they get home. They just don't, don't know where to turn. In some respects, it's more valuable than ever that you can ring them up at home. In some respects, it's that, to me, that's what nursing is all about. You, you step up when things are difficult and you help out to the best of your ability. But there's also the side that makes you think, well, I'll be up to the job. <laughs>
generally recognise the work we do, although sometimes we do get a bit of abuse um, for things that are beyond our control if they don't have everything they want right there and then. Senior management sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes not so much. Um, so yeah, it can be hard at times feeling a bit undervalued. Uh, you sometimes feel like, oh, why are they asking us to do this much extra work with no extra resources? You know, they've got to go home at some point. I was a union rep for a while, um, and it is interesting to see different perspectives from, from time to time because it it is getting in those other person's shoes and actually seeing well they're not necessarily just making your life difficult because you know the difficult people it's or that they don't know what the situation is that they have their own pressures coming from central government or from local commissioners or from just the expectations that are placed on the health service. It's been very mixed actually. Mm. I think some people have been very, you know, key workers and you're doing a great job. Um, but then you see, especially in social media, sometimes, well, you're just doing your job, you know, and they don't see that actually just doing your job can put you at a lot more risk. Um, you know, if you if you particularly if you're working with COVID patients, you know, you are putting your life on the line. You know, people were giving presents and things to NHS staff. And I think sometimes that, that should have gone to care workers and other workers as well, where it didn't. As it's gone on, you see more people and and the, the pressure that's come to bear on people. But yeah, back in March we're all in this together. You know, that this is you know we'll, we'll get through this but you understand that after seven or eight months of constant pressure and seeing savings go seeing businesses go to the wall um you know seeing livelihoods threatened you can understand why some people start getting resentful i don't know i think i think there's very mixed feelings about the the clap for carer things i don't i don't know that people you know clapping on the doorstep i think it was good for community i think it was as a good as an expression of solidarity yeah i think there's a there's a lot of mixed feelings about that i mean i, I went out and clapped on the doorstep you've got to remember key workers weren't just doctors and nurses it was the people at the petrol station and tesco and you know, people in, in rest homes moving in, in some cases. So, you know, I felt that there should be an expression of appreciation for those people. I mean, I think, I think we all need hope to survive. If there's no hope, then we all go down. There's no point to life. So we need hope to survive. And I think um, when I look around my work colleagues, they give me hope. I look at a team of people who, you know, have maybe done 30, 40 years in service and still, you know, come in, give it their all. You know, it really encourages me that there's still managers out there who will, will actively say, well, let's just forget about the money for now what's the right thing to do for the patient. The fact that sometimes you look after somebody that comes in who might be really elderly, really frail, um, or comes in walking with a, you know, a young person who's walking with a stick, but at the end of finishing a programme of exercise or rehabilitation goes out, they're not using the stick, they can walk to the shops. Those sorts of things are really hopeful, you know, that, that people can improve and, and feel better. I always have a hope that my patients will do better. Obviously they you know they don't always and I think hope you know it's hope or faith that you know prayer certainly has a big role in my in my job. I often find myself little shooting up prayers that you know it'll work for a patient or um if I know a patient's not gonna make it that, that they'll be peaceful hope to make things better I suppose. I think hope is such a big part of what we can do that uh, you know, the, the patients that are coming to see us often are receiving some of the worst news that they'll ever receive during their life 
Um, so to provide them with a hope of a possible treatment. Definitely family, family time, always spend Christmas with one or other family, haven't we? And yes. then, and then walk, uh, New Year, Boxing Day, um, just the time of, of celebration as well, oh. you know, try and keep things, sort of the Christmas story as, as the big focus of it. And, and hope, I guess, that's what, you know, when we think of the Christmas story, Jesus coming in, that was that, that hope. Rest and recharging just rest and recharge at the end of the year um and kind of prepare for the um the start of the the next year the next year challenges i love christmas i love all of christmas i love the tacky bits i love the christmas carols i love all the christmas food i love getting presents i love giving presents so i love all of christmas um I love the fact that when you, when I used to go into work on Christmas Day with a positive attitude, you felt like you brought more and it gave uh, value, I suppose, to, to Christmas. I think the other thing is it, it's taught Christmas teachers you different things at different times over your life. And I think it's taught us to appreciate uh, traditions and rituals. I think it's shows that God wasn't afraid to come down into filth and hopelessness and darkness and bring light and love into different situations. Um, and, it, and it's all those cliches about family and friends and probably looking at the things that really matter in, in life. So yeah, it's, it's celebrating. I think it, Christmas teaches us to celebrate life. How did you, and maybe even your children, respond to that question? What do you want to be when you grow up? What have we learnt about values and worth during this global pandemic? Do we still value wealth, status and self-importance? Or have we been challenged to value more those who care, serve humbly and give so much of themselves during this pandemic? Who do you want to say a big thank you to in your community? What groups or workers have we tended to take for granted that we value even more now? Holy God, we thank you that you are the perfect carer, surrounding us with your protection and comfort. We pray for all those in the NHS and other caring work May they know that they are appreciated and loved in this difficult time. May they know your protection through the challenges to come. May they know your peace and your hope. In Jesus' name, Amen. Blessed are those who serve others so selflessly, in humbleness and care, that they will act as God's hands and feet on earth shining the Christ light in their communities.